The government has liberalized foreign direct investment norms in the defense sector. What does that really mean on the ground, strategically, for a company like Airbus? I'm very pleased to welcome on the show today Pierre Debosse, president of the Airbus Group in India. Thank you very much for joining us on NDTV. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming, for, for coming to our premises. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to get straight to it. Yes. We're starting with what's been making headlines in recent days, which is a more liberalized foreign direct investment regime for the defense sector, in a nutshell, allowing for greater foreign investment in the defense sector. How do you assess it? Uh, well, I see many things in it. Number one, I see a government that actually really engages with industry. It's something that I had spoken publicly about beforehand, but I know that I was speaking out loud what many of my peers thought as well. Uh, the government listened to us, engaged with us, came out with what I view as a very positive uh, liberalization. Uh, that is going to be an important step for us to go forward. Um, How does it, in real terms, change the way Airbus views the India opportunity? And I say, you know, I know that I ask this because I reckon that one announcement on greater foreign direct investment is not the be-all and end-all. No, it is not. You're absolutely right. But it's an important thing because we, we intend to come here and to invest quite substantially in what is a very complex industry. There are many other things that will have to be liberalized and the government has been working at it. You probably read about that uh, meeting that took place at the Prime Minister's office just a few uh, days ago. Uh, I had the opportunity to be there with a lot of the Indian manufacturers and a few other foreign OEMs. We're, the government engages with us. It starts and it really tries to look at everything that can be organized in such a way that private industry can actually bloom and flourish and contribute to the aerospace sector over here. Uh, taxes, offset regulations, procurement process. A lot of things continue to or need to be, be streamlined, addressed. be addressed. Uh, but the FDI for us was a very important aspect. You know, I ask because the foreign direct investment limit being raised, the norms being liberalized, combined with the Make in India focus for the defense sector should imply that things have changed on the ground. And I wanted your frank thoughts on that. You know, when you add Make in India sort of focus and push uh, by the government in the defense sector, and you look at the uh, easier, greater FDI norms, does it mean that the opportunity looks much more bright? The opportunity looks brighter for us because it will certainly broaden the scope of things we are ready to do here in India. Uh, having said that, um, as I implied earlier, uh, there will have to be other needs, whether it is in the field of taxes, of offsets rules, of uh, procurement processes. Which are complex. Which are incredibly complex and actually quite slow, I must say. What counts for us is not only that we do business, is that in the end we have a satisfied customer. And the, the customer is the forces over here. And these are the people that defend India. And when they have needs, they need to be answered fairly quickly. I think that today's uh, Ministry of Defense has understood that. And that's why they're working on these complex procedures to try and streamline them. Make in India for the Airbus Group. What does it really mean today? And what is your roadmap for Make in India going forward? So, today, first and foremost, uh, and we've launched this motto, what we buy in India, we make in India. Uh, mostly for our commercial business, uh, we've been buying uh, increasingly from India in the past uh, 10 years, uh, crossing the map of 500 million US dollars last year in value. It is a significant milestone for Indian industry, I can tell you. Uh, it is not driven by offsets, which I think is an important thing. It means that we've been developing here suppliers that fit in our global supplier base and that are truly competitive 
and uh, truly useful to us. So this is a win for us, it's a win for India. So that's $500 million worth of procurement in 2015. And I imagine this would be from medium-sized companies? And what's the profile of the companies that you're procuring from? There's a lot of, we're procuring from about 45 companies and we're procuring engineering services, we're procuring detailed parts, uh, components, uh, aerostructure parts, if you will. There's a lot of different things we are procuring. Uh, a lot of them are from MSMEs, but not only. You have so. uh, the big groups that we are, by the way, going to associate with in the future also for the uh, defense programs that we're looking at are present. Um, so we, we've been buying quite a number of things, and these different uh, players are likely to constitute later what I would call an ecosystem yeah. of companies feeding into the final assembly lines that we hope to set up when we get the contracts, because that is fundamental. That's why uh, I'm not asking, when are you setting up those assembly <laughs> lines? But I imagine that this procurement, the relationship with these companies, is helping you gain comfort on the idea of manufacturing in India as well. Uh, thank you for asking it, but you're absolutely right. I think it's an important aspect of our credibility over here. We've been buying from India because we like these suppliers, not because we were forced to buy from them. And uh, that is very important. We've been uh, working together. We have a department in this company that we call supplier development. Uh, we've been helping people reach the right standards that are important in this very safety conscious industry that uh, aerospace is. And, um, and yes, of course, these people are going to be important to, to fit into that supply chain. But what happens in the next phase or the next leg of Make in India? I ask because, you know, there are partnerships in the public domain that Airbus has talked about, yes. notably with Mahindra and the Tatas. That's correct. So there are two partnerships with the Tatas for what is known here as the Avro Replacement Program. We bid with them uh, with uh, one of our small military cargo airplanes called the C-295. Uh, we're looking forward to this happening. Uh, it seems to be in the pipe very well for the moment. And if that goes through, there will be a final assembly line for the C-295 and there will be again a supply chain that will have to f f fill it, not only from India, it will of course come also from the world. You have engines, you have things that are not manufactured in India, yeah, yeah. but it will be a substantial step for industry. With the Mahindras, we're planning to set up a joint venture uh, to manufacture military helicopters here in India. And we already have targeted that we will uh, uh, put in India, if the contract comes, uh, the Panther helicopter that currently is manufactured in France. Uh, we would uh, establish the final assembly line here in India and uh, to serve both the needs of a program known as the NUH, the Naval Utility Helicopter, for the Navy, and then for the world as well, because there is world demand. And that's where the huge opportunity lies, not just in India, but also beyond India. Uh, I have to ask, I'm not sure I'm going to get an answer, but now with the more liberalized foreign direct investment norms, it begs the question, so are you going to look at greater than 49%? I can predict your answer on that one, that it's, uh, you know, a matter of discussions between you and the Mahindras. You're uh, absolutely right. In the end, the amount of uh, control in the amount of investment is one of the aspects of an overall balance. It's a contractual balance. So it's what do we contribute, what do they contribute, what risk do we take, what risk do they take, and how do we make all this work? So I can't give you an answer right now but it is one of the factors that are certainly being looked at. We've addressed, in a sense, the good news when it comes to the defense sector in India. But the challenges haven't been erased by the good news, the good news being on the foreign direct investment fund, uh, front or the, you know, make in India focus. Uh, what are the challenges that this government must, should, has to? I, I'm using a whole bunch of phrases to drive home that point because there are a There's host a lot of to challenges. Still, of course. And if I go beyond what I already talked about, the streamlining, taxes, offset rules, etc., uh, I think one of the issues over here in this country is uh, skilled labor for that 
area of the business. And so certainly there needs to be substantial investment into skilling uh, the type of people. Now, whether it's all government or whether it's government and private industry together is open. Are you but already doing, say, for example, you know, sort of high-end research work in India? Oh, we are. We actually are, uh, because I talked earlier of how much we are sourcing over here, but actually we have a full engineering center uh, in Bangalore. Eighty percent of the people we employ in India are actually related to engineering. They contribute to designing better products for us. They're extremely good at what they do. We also buy from two uh, we call them offshore development uh, sites for us, two companies that uh, provide us substantially good engineering work out of India as well. So yes, uh, we, we definitely do this here and this would have to be one of the capabilities tied to the uh, joint venture with, uh, with the Mahindras, for instance. So, you know, I veered off there, but I'm coming back to the challenges and you said, look, developing a skill base in India that matches the needs of the aerospace and defense sector is critical. Beyond that, what else must this government be addressing? So, uh, first, speaking of the skill base, I want to add something because you veer towards engineers, but actually I'm also speaking of technicians, of not everybody needs to, needs be, to be an engineer. There, there needs to be people to uh, populate the plants, and that is also very important. Uh, beyond that, I would say it's important, and it's part of our own roadmap, not to function only with the big guys on the block. Uh, they may be designated one day as strategic partners by the government of India uh, to be uh, heading certain segments of the defense industry. But really the MSMEs, mm. uh, those that we've been doing a good deal of our procurement from, are absolutely fundamental, they're crucial. That's where a lot of the energy, a lot of the ambition, a lot of the innovation lies. And they are going to be basically the earth in which this industry is going to be able to sprout, if you will. How would you answer those that say, look, whether you're talking about $500 million in procurement from India, the moment you compare it with what's happening in the automobile sector, for example, that number by itself seems modest. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we all acknowledge that this is an industry or a sector that's opening up very cautiously. As a final thought from you, where are we in the defense sector sort of continuum, if you would call it that? Um, you know, is it just beginning to flower in the Indian context? I'm not sure which analogy to pick. But, you know, where are we? Compare India to any other market that you've uh, studied closely when it comes to the defense sector. Is there something that we can borrow? Is there something that we can sort of model uh, this industry on? So I'm sure that there's a lot of potential. This is a very large country with substantial needs, particularly on the defense field, uh, but also in the commercial field, actually. Uh, I think there's a number of models, but those that I know most and that have worked quite well when it comes to procurement in defense and developing an industry, you look at Europe, you have France, you have the UK, you have Germany. Uh, these are our home countries, but look at the US as well. I think there's a constant rule in these. There's got to be a very good amount of continuous work together between the end user, the forces, the budget owner, the Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Finance or whoever it is, uh, the people who design and who manufacture the products. And if in these very complex programs, if that doesn't happen, if it is not an easy contact, if it is all very, um, um, how do you call it, uh, very contractual in nature, uh, very often you have a breakdown in the system. So breaking the silos is important. I think it's, a very, it's, it's fundamental. I recognize the efforts of the government of India today to open up to private industry. I think they are right. Because if the industry is patriotic, and industries can absolutely be patriotic, and at the same time, there's no contradiction, profitability-oriented, then they are going to be sustainable. They're going to be providers of jobs. They're going to be providers of technology. They're going to be providers of self-sustainability, uh, if you will. And the last thing I want to say is that if you look at these countries that I just referred to, 
they are not allergic at all to foreign OEMs. Mm -hmm. In fact, they've been able to defend their interests very well, yet allowing foreign OEMs to come in, private companies to thrive in their markets, to provide and answer the needs of the local markets. And these countries very often have been able to protect their vital interests by having very pointed controls over those specific aspects, whether it's technology, whether it's access to certain things that for them are critical strategically, but nevertheless letting private industry do its work. And private industry is very nimble and private industry works forward. So, Well, on that note, I think um, certainly a new chapter. We have to see what gets written in this new chapter. Pierre Dibasse, thank you very much for joining us on NDTV. Pleasure talking to you. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much. Thank you.